So I'm Dr. Ed Lengel. I'm Senior Director of Programs of the National World War II Museum. I've done a lot of things in my career everywhere from the Revolutionary War to World War I and now to World War II. And I'm a pretty much an old-fashioned, dyed-in-the-wool military historian, but I'm fortunate to have as a colleague Dr. Keith Huxon, who is not only a military historian, but an expert economic historian. And economic history was one of those things I learned when I had to in graduate school, but more often than not, I just ran away from it. So Keith, could you tell us something about yourself and your career? What attracted you to economic and diplomatic history too? And uh, what's your interest in this topic? Well, Ed, uh, I've had kind of an interesting career path, but the short version of this is uh, I was actually trained as an economic historian initially. I one of those people that took the long route in graduate school and had first a degree, master's degree in economic history, and then took a second master's degree in diplomatic history. And then when I took my doctorate from George Washington University, my dissertation was on the American economy during the war and moving into the post-war period, how we reconverted the economy which had both, it was mainly a domestic economic focus, but there was also international uh, uh, focus with that that goes along with, you know, the uh, diplomatic history that underlies the uh, foundations of power that uh, you see in the great big shifts, you know, world power and, and great power status amongst the countries in World War II. So I always had a deep interest in the war itself and without going through my entire career path, that's what eventually led me to the museum. <laughs> Great, well, you know, as we look at the economics of World War II, uh, obviously an important backdrop is the Great Depression, and we should spend some time talking about that because clearly that, that had a huge impact, not only on, you know, the, the onset of World War II, but on how it was conducted. So you say something about the depression itself, which countries were impacted most? It was an international event, really. It was an international depression. Uh, in 1929, of course, the stock market goes south in, uh, well, in the United States. The truth of the matter is, is that much of Europe had not recovered in the 1920s. I won't go through, you know, the Dawes plan and all these various arrangements that came through with German reparations. But Arguably, what you see under the immediate influence of the Depression in the early 30s is the radicalization of four regimes that were already pretty radical as they come to power or maintain their power, fascist Italy, uh, Imperial Japan, uh, the Soviet Union, and of course, Nazi Germany. Uh, Japan, of course, embarks on militarization as part of the scheme to solve their economic problems. They lack natural resources. They see a expansion of an empire, you know, into China and eventually Southeast Asia, a Southern strategy, as you know, uh, becomes their solution over the decade of the 30s. Uh, Italy has pioneered something of a command economy that both the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany take to new heights. Uh, the Soviets unroll uh, a five-year plan under Stalin in 1929. One of the things that if you study this period, you've got to keep in mind is that the Soviets lied. <laughs> you know, they weren't really achieving their objectives. But in 1934, a lot of people didn't know that. And Stalin's announcing, hey, we're getting uh, out of this depression. Communism works in a way that capitalism can't, cannot. Keep in mind, in 1933, this is the absolute trough of the depression in the United States. We've got 25% unemployment. Hitler comes to power in 1933, and he immediately embarks on something similar to a five-year plan, except that he's going to claim that Nazi Germany solved the Depression within four years. Of course, the Soviet Union and communist philosophy, Hitler is completely against this. It is, it is an anathema to his worldview. He intends to destroy it, so he's got to outperform it in the 1930s. But all of this made a big impression to people around the world. So if we look at the other side and the capitalist answer to that, um, 
I'm a British historian by training, and you know, I would argue that if you look at Great Britain and France in 1939 and 1940, and the relative weakness of their military and the, the weakness of their military equipment had a lot to do with their retrenchment and cost cutting in the 1930s and their own responses to the Great Depression. But how about the United States and how about Roosevelt and his New Deal? What, what did that amount to? Did it have any success in uh, staving off economic disaster? My personal interpretation of the New Deal is that it was a political success for Franklin Roosevelt. When you look at where the country was in 1933, there was a demand that the country do something. The Hoover administration was a disaster. And there was this thought that democracy couldn't respond. Capitalism couldn't respond to a crisis like this, unlike these more radical powers where you know you had authoritarian or even totalitarian governments telling their citizens, this is what we're going to do. So in a sense to me, Roosevelt really did save political democracy with his experimentation in the New Deal. And you did see some economic recovery and results, but it's important to remember, we never do fully recover in the 1930s with the New Deal. Um, there are a number of ways to measure this. You know, the numbers are a little foggy for us in the 21st century. But basically, in 1929, the United States, one measure I've seen, had a GDP of about $100 billion. 1939, after dropping all the way to $56 billion, you know, cutting the economy nearly in half in 1933, we finally climbed up over $100 billion GDP again. So you'd say, okay, that's a decade of lost production. But what you have to keep in mind is that we're actually still not recovered because we've got a larger population. We're producing less with a larger population. But Roosevelt saved democracy, I think, in a real sense, the idea of democracy and the idea that it could uh, react to these things, even though he did not, you know, the New Deal did not, in the end, produce a full economic recovery. The war did that. Right. And it's interesting, and, though, that that remains such a controversial topic uh, to, the, to yeah. this day. <laughs> So how open did the, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say open to reinterpret all, reinterpretation all the time. And if you don't mind, Ed, I'll, I'll follow up with that. You know, you brought up uh, your background as, as a British historian. There is this, you know, back and forth between the United States and the United Kingdom all through the 1920s and 30s. And a lot of it revolves around the gold standard, mm -hmm. where Britain traditionally had been able to you know, lead the world economy because the pound was tied to gold. And now they couldn't afford to do that anymore. They go off the gold standard in 1931. The United States never really steps up at this time. And you know, there are economic historians who have pointed out that the international system, the financial system, has to have a banker of last resort, as it's called. You know a nation that's got the financial resources, that's got a currency that everybody else can rely on. And you don't have that in the 20s and 30s. Britain is declining. The United States is still not ready to step up and be that banker of last resort, even though we have the economic power, but we don't have the political willpower to make those, uh, take on those responsibilities at this time. And again, that's, these are things that are gonna have to be addressed at the end of World War II. How important a thinker while we're talking about Great Britain was the great economist John Maynard Keynes and what type of an influence did he have not only in the UK but in the United States in their response to the depression? I've always been fascinated with Keynes. He had an enormous impact that really outlasted his life. Uh, he's a key figure for the British in World War II as you know. He negotiates all of their financial arrangements with the United States. Keynes's great insight, I think, uh, was his book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest in Money, where he gives this model of a capitalist economy. He gives theoretical hope that the economy can continue to expand over time, over history, if we follow certain policies. Now, he actually 
you know, said, look at, say, uh, I'll, I'll put it in American terms, look at what happened in the United States in late 19th century, where you have an enormous industrial expansion, 1870s, 1880s, and then you have the Depression of 1893. So think of things going up and then going down. And then you have enormous expansion through the 20s, and then you have the Depression come in. Uh, well, 1921 is what I was thinking. And then another expansion all the way through the 20s, and then you have the Great Depression. And I know it may look funny with the way I'm moving my hand, but Keynes's point was that over time, while prosperity was indeed getting better, the depressions were also getting worse. And so his idea was, how do we smooth out that business cycle? So essentially you see a trajectory going up all this time. And the answer he comes up with is essentially two parts. The first is during the good times, the government saves money. It's got money in the bank so that in the bad times when a depression comes, the government can engage in deficit spending, stimulate, pump money, and spending into the economy that will turn things around and get things on an upward trajectory again. And this is something that has really guided uh, not just Americans, but you know, it had a, he had a huge uh, impact in the United States with economists like Alvin Hansen, and uh, he, he was a Harvard economist who was probably the leading Keynesian in the United States, a lot of government uh, figures. He really made a huge impact, and his theories, of course, uh, had a huge impact in the post-war, really a lot of countries built their economic models on that, and it lasted into the 1960s and 1970s before Eventually, there were problems with his, his model that uh, I won't get into here, but uh, people still talk about him today. Look at the last 10 years. People went back and said after 2008, Keynesian economics. Very much so. And he's, of course, very controversial today, but I don't think that anybody could doubt that he's one of the most important, uh, most influential economic thinkers of the past 100 years. So he affects a lot of different aspects both of the the period before the war but also even more so the economic response to the war itself and reconstruction so we can get back to that a little bit later let's go on to 1939 and uh what impact did say the onset of war in europe we know war had been going on in asia for several years already at that point but the onset of the war in europe and then lend lease for example what impact did that have economically on the United States in the last months uh, leading up to our own intervention in the war? Here's where the United States really starts to recover economically. When Europe goes to war in 1940, you know, Hitler has a succession of triumphs. And essentially to keep things, you know, to keep the British in war, uh, Lend-Lease eventually becomes the answer. Roosevelt has some other uh, issues that he's got to deal with because of the isolationist uh, movement and the laws that Congress had passed in the middle of the 1930s that forbade things like loans and sales of arms and equipment to belligerent nations. So he had to legally sidestep and find solutions to how to get around this. But to your point, Ed, Really, what happens is that American industry starts to pick up with the war. And as you've probably seen, if you've been to the museum for our audience watching out there, uh, really, to my mind, the moment that this becomes painfully clear is May the 13th, 1940. Three days before that, the Germans are marching into you know, the Low Countries, headed towards France. George Marshall, chief of staff of the army, goes in the Oval Office with Franklin Roosevelt and tells the president, Mr. President, if the Germans landed five divisions anywhere in North America, I couldn't stop them from doing anything they wanted. Mm. And this is really the, you know, uh, wake up moment. I'll say come to Jesus moment, if you will, for the American government. Roosevelt says to Marshall, essentially, well, what do we have to do? And it's hey, we're understaffed, we don't have the equipment, we've got to start building this military. At the end of May, May uh, 28th, I think it was, Roosevelt placed a phone call 
to William Knudsen. Now, William Knudsen was the CEO of General Motors. Roosevelt actually called Bernard Baruch, a famous financier on Wall Street, who had managed our World War I effort and said, will you manage basically you know, getting the economy mobilized for the military? And Baruch begged off and said, I'm too old. But Roosevelt said, well, then who do you recommend? Give me the top three production men in the United States. And Baruch's answer was first Knudsen, second Knudsen, third Knudsen. <laughs> so Roosevelt had his guy. He calls him and Bill Knudsen essentially left General Motors and became the first dollar a year man and was working on reconversion uh, for 18 months before Pearl Harbor. He actually estimated in June of 1940 that it would take 18 months to have American industry changed enough towards to be set up towards making military goods. And he was very prescient. He hit it right on the nose. 18 months later, Pearl Harbor occurred. But it's a very interesting story. If you ever dig into the details on this, he was operating essentially without a legal sanction. He could not tell companies what to do. Mm -hmm. They were agreeing to start reconverting their factories into military production based on a handshake because he was that well trusted. Yeah, it's, you know, the contrast with, with World War I could not have been greater, I would think. And, of course, FDR had served in the administration of President Woodrow Wilson at that time as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. So he saw what was going on. But in uh, 1917, the United States remained, when uh, we entered the war in 1917, still a consumer goods uh, industrial economy, absolutely unprepared, no, no uh, infrastructure to produce any type of equipment of uh, any heavy equipment at all. So the United States had to rely throughout the whole of its intervention in World War I on uh, France and Great Britain for tanks, for planes, for guns, for everything. So no, the total unpreparedness. So the contrast with World War II was, was huge uh, because Roosevelt uh, with uh, Knudsen did make this effort proactively as soon as they saw the way the wind was blowing uh, to prepare for it. So with all that in mind, was the United States prepared economically to fight this war on December 7th, 1941? Uh, we were not, but we were closer than we had been in 1939, I think is the short answer. And uh, Ed, you make a great point there that, you know, in World War II, the United States is going to be the arsenal of democracy, yes. where we are supplying not only our own military, which goes from 174,000, I think it is, troops in the army uh, in 1939 to over 12 million in 1944. For. We're not only equipping all of our own military forces, we're also sending goods to our main allies, Britain and the Soviet Union. And that's a key part of the story, I, uh, backing up, I guess, just a little bit on this. You know, I think that Len Lease essentially diplomatically in those years, 1939, 40, 41, for Franklin Roosevelt and his diplomacy, this was his political masterstroke. You know, Britain was alone fighting Nazi Germany, and they were on the ropes in 1940. By early 41, Roosevelt gets this legislation passed through a Congress that, having fought an election that he just promised the American people in October of 1940, your boys won't be sent into any foreign wars. We're essentially picking up the tab for the British war effort. You know, and Hitler's not a fool. We're going to be sending war material over there and it's gonna be used to kill Germans. Now Roosevelt says, well, we'll just lend it or lease it. We just want it back at the end of the day. That stuff's not coming back. Slightly and, battered. But you know, <laughs> I love where he tells Congress, you know, he says, this is like when this situation is like when your neighbor's house is on fire and you can basically uh, either give your neighbor the garden hose, or you can say, I'll sell it to you for 15 bucks. He says, all we want is the fire out. We don't want it to spread to our house. So the thing to do is lend it over there. But as we just said, we're not talking about garden hoses here. Right. 
we're talking about multi-millions and millions of dollars of industrial and military equipment, very valuable stuff. And there's also the question, if you get into the weeds on this stuff in 1941, you know, you had American military people who were very, very concerned that we weren't keeping enough for ourselves. So there's this huge demand to keep expanding. And the truth of the matter is, is that we're not there in 1941, December the 7th, when we, you know, are attacked at Pearl Harbor. We're not ready. But once that happened, once we were officially at war, the nation mobilized and we had the green light to, you know, expand to reaches that we had never before even considered, heights that seemed impossible just five years before by the end of the war. And one area I just would mention that uh, Lend-Lease had an impact on the battlefield. I've always been particularly interested in the North African campaign. And you see even before the United States entered World War II, the shipment of American Grant and Stuart tanks uh, really played a huge role in the British ability to fight Rommel in uh, Egypt and Libya. So uh, it, it had a big impact. And I want to get back a little bit later on to the importance of American aid to the Soviet Union uh, and equipment, which is something that is far too often overlooked and something uh, that I imagine uh, Russians uh, themselves may prefer to overlook uh, in some respects these days. Don't want to get too controversial, but still, it's important. But going back to um, December 7th and the months afterwards into 1942, what uh, measures, what economic measures did the United States take uh, after the uh, America comes into the war. I mean, Japan attacks, uh, then Germany and Italy declare war in the United States on December 11th. We're in it all the way, uh, much to Winston Churchill's delight. Uh, so um, what, does, what does FDR do? What, do? what does the United States do economically in those months? I think that you hit the main theme right on the head, Ed, when you said, you know, uh, we're in it all the way, all together. Roosevelt, you know, had some great lines that if you see the propaganda posters, he talks about, you know, this is the greatest, I can't remember the exact quote, but, you know, this is the greatest enterprise in our American history and every man, woman, and child has a role to play. And the whole nation mobilized economically. If you were elderly or a child, you could contribute by scrap drives, by buying war bonds, by planting victory gardens. We know that Rosie the Riveter is the famous poster, but you know there's truth that six million women, I believe is the number, went into industrial jobs for the first time where they weren't just being you know, secretaries, they were actually being riveters and electricians and doing that work because so many of the young men, of course, were going into the military. And I think what's important about this, uh, again, if you kind of look at things like this, aircraft production is one of the big measures here. Mm -hmm. In 1940, Roosevelt, as the Germans were sweeping across France, said to Congress in a speech that he would like to see 50,000 aircraft produced for the United States to keep us out of the war. And some economists out there basically said, that's crazy talk. That'll never happen. Roosevelt was talking 50,000 planes for the entire war. Well, we produced over 300,000 aircraft for World War II, and we produced over 100,000 airplanes in 1944 alone. Double what Roosevelt had said, we, this is what we need for the entire war. That's an incredible effort. When you look at what uh, Ford did, you know, converting their plant in Michigan at Willow Run, where they were building B-24 Liberators. I believe they built 8,800 uh, of those. I know we built 12,700 B-17s, almost 4,000 B-29s. These aircraft were getting more and more sophisticated. The B-17, for example, had 20,000 parts in it. The B-29 had 106,000 parts in it. When you think about exponentially, what that means for these manufacturers who have got to make all those metal molds and, and put these things together. And in the aircraft industry, you had basically five major manufacturers at the time. Because it was a wartime emergency, if you can imagine this, when a certain company at a certain plant would lack some of those parts, another company, if they had that stuff, 
would ship it to the other company so that they could keep on going on, um, you know, making, making aircraft for the war. Um, it's, it's, you know, uh, it's may not be the most competitive thing and they probably wouldn't do that in peacetime, but it was wartime. It was different. And it's a great example of how the country came together and how we were able to do this. And I'll, I'll throw out one last statistic that it's always amazed me. You know, economists talk about uh, what is full employment and full employment was a huge issue all through World War II. In 1946, we actually pass a full employment act through Congress that made full employment an official economic policy of the United States. Well, most economists say it's about 5%. You know, at any given time, 5% of the workforce is either, you know, taking leisure, unemployed, looking for work. 1.2% in 1944. 1.2% unemployment. It's astonishing. Everyone was working and doing their part during the war. We've never approached anything like it since. And my grandfather was one of those essential workers. He was a steel worker in uh, Pennsylvania, carpenter steel. Um, you know, so that that certainly is something that that I'm I'm aware of. And we have a, a question um, here from from Mark, which I think is relevant. I want to throw it to you before we move on. And Mark asks, "What was the quality of work during this mass production?" You know, that's that's an important question, I think. Generally, I, th I would answer that it was very high. It's not 100% across the board. There were uh, cases, uh, this is part of how Harry Truman rose to attention uh, in the Senate, where he was looking at war profiteering and things like this, where some companies did shoddy work. The best mark of excellence um, was the Army Navy E for Excellence Award, which uh, out of 100,000 contracts handed out by the War Department in World War II, 4,283 companies, so roughly 4.2%, uh, actually received this award. And um, if you come to the museum, you'll see we have an 11 foot long pennant that went to the Brown Shipbuilding Company on display. You can see little pins that were, maybe your father uh, got one, Ed, you know, working in a steel mill, that uh, these were essential industries, but it, it allowed the employees to show their pride and the work that they were doing. And, you know, um, these were not participation trophies. Uh, yeah. But it, it, uh, overall, I would say that the, that generally the, the quality was, was pretty high and keep in mind that, you know, agriculture and things like that also plays a, a big role. You've got to feed the yeah. nation as well. Yeah. So. Um, and that may be something that's that's overlooked a little bit. And a touch on that is, and I know that was the case with my with my grandfather and other men and women who worked in the factories and other industries during that period. They had huge pride in what they did. Uh, and part of that was perhaps a legacy of the depression. You know, when they felt like they were undervalued, it was hard to get a job, and now suddenly here they are all pulled together in a common cause. You know, working working huge long hours uh, for the national war effort. They did that with, with massive pride. And from there, I touch on a, another uh, topic I wanted to ask you, FDR. You know, FDR was a great communicator, uh, but he was also a, I don't know if this makes sense, a master public psychologist. You know, mm -hmm. some of the things that you mentioned, such as the scrap drives and the victory gardens, I think it'd be hard to say those had a very great impact on the war effort. In some ways, they they may have been more just for show. So, was there a, was there a psychological element to this as well? I mean, so much of economics is psychology. I would agree with that, Ed. I think that you know uh, every little bit helped. And if you've got a garden planted out in the back, that you know your family is self sufficient because of this. Um, and you live in a rural part of Louisiana, where I live, where, where we live, you know, uh, or someplace like that, you're helping because at least other resources elsewhere are not going to have to support you. Is it going to win the war? No, we, we both know that. But uh, again, to your point, it's FDR as the master politician. He got everyone involved. And this explains a lot of his diplomacy earlier, where step by step in 1940, 41, you know, uh, I think he saw that the United States was not going to be able to stay out of this war, but he avoided the 
problem that Woodrow Wilson had in World War I, where Wilson went to war with a divided public opinion. Right. Roosevelt never got ahead of public opinion. And this is the great irony, of course, of Pearl Harbor, is that while it was a terrible blow to the Pacific Fleet, as you know, the Japanese did the one thing that was guaranteed to unite American public opinion. You know, Charles Lindbergh had been leading the cause against all this, and now he wants to go join the the, the USAAF, and Roosevelt wouldn't let him for right. political reasons, obviously, but uh, but everyone wanted to play their 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 part. And I think that there was also on the home front, you know, if you look at propaganda posters, I'm always reminded of a newsreel that I saw. It wasn't propaganda. It was a real story where this woman whose job was the safety inspector of, of a life vest that were going on military ships. The short version of it is her son was in the Navy. His ship gets uh, torpedoed. He winds up in the water and he winds up with a life vest that had her mark on it that this wow. life vest was good. And they did a newsreel about it. And this was the point was that it mattered if a rifle clip didn't work. It mattered if a propeller was not properly, you know, uh, uh, produced and trimmed uh, uh, by, by a lathe. It mattered that you did your job on the home front as best as you could, because ultimately it could save somebody's life. Great. So um, we have a number of questions. Uh, some of them we'll save for the question and answer period, but I will pluck a few out uh, when they're kind of, they seem to fit into the course of our conversation right now. And uh, I was going to ask you, you know, how did this economic miracle happen? And I think you've pretty much answered that. Uh, on the whole, but Steve asks a question that's a component of that, which is important: is how did how did uh, the factories manage to train these workers so quickly uh, to to carry out this this kind of work? Uh, well, you use a lot of women is uh, part of the answer, and if you go on YouTube, I'll just put it this way: you can see these videos that we kind of laugh at now where it's women, you know, being taught that, you know, you have to put your hair back in a certain way because otherwise it might get caught in a drill press. You know, it looks funny when you watch this stuff and we kind of look at it today and go, well, of course anybody would know that. But back then, this was a new job and these women took it seriously. It wasn't just women, of course, it was men as well. But I'll throw this out as an anecdote. Um, at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, you had the Calutron girls. These were mainly farm girls from Tennessee who were brought in to basically sit there as the uh, uranium was being uh, mined, or, or, or I should say refined. And they had these you know, bank of dials that their job was to sit there for eight hours a day and make sure that the dial basically stayed in the middle, that it didn't do this or this. And Ernst Lawrence was the Nobel Prize winning physicist out at Cal Berkeley, who he had had all his PhD students running these calutrons. And the military leader at Oak Ridge, a guy named Kenneth Nichols, Colonel Nichols, basically reported to Lawrence and said, well, guess what? The uh, farm girls are doing better than the physics PhDs that you've been bringing in here to run the calutrons. Lawrence couldn't believe it. So they had a little friendly bet on it. And basically, the farm girls wiped the floor with the physics PhDs again, even though they knew so much more. These girls didn't know what they were actually producing, but Nichols was not surprised at all. He said the reason why they were so successful is because they didn't ask questions. They did what they were told. Essentially, he said, they were trained as soldiers. This was their job. Mm -hmm. This was their duty in this. And so, you know, People took their jobs very seriously. And if you were making aircraft or whatever it was you were doing, you know, going back to, as I mentioned, you, you know, just certifying that the life vest works, people took their jobs very seriously. And, uh, you know, people are capable of great things. This is one of the things that, you know, you see with uh, the World War II generation. It opened up vistas for so many of these people, opportunities that they had never had before. And it, it made them want better lives in the post-war. Yeah, and that, that touches 
on a couple of topics that we could maybe spend some more time on in the question and answer is the effectiveness of American industrial organization. Uh, part of that had to do with, as you said, the, the um, you know, Roosevelt's and Knudsen noticing in May 1940 that something needed to be done and preparing that and preparing American industry for the possibility of having to ramp up, uh, you know, production and move people who had been making refrigerators. Now they're, they're making tanks. Uh, mm -hmm. kind of kind of preparing that, the effectiveness of, of industrial organization. But also, unlike today, uh, you still had a large sector of the American workforce that was at least used to manufacturing, uh, which, you know, is something that we can easily forget about. You're, although there are cases like these, these young women, the Calatron girls, who maybe didn't have any experience at all in this before, uh, for others, for, for male and female workers, it wasn't necessarily such a big leap. Uh, we're not talking about people, you know, who sit in front of computers all day long and now suddenly they're having to go out onto the factory floor. It, the transition was not quite so profound. Uh, I want to move on. We have, I don't know, five or six minutes before we open up for uh, questions from the public, but I have a couple of things I wanted to, to get to. And in, in 1944, even before the Normandy invasion, thoughts turned toward reconstruction uh, and toward after the war. Uh, and the amount of devastation really in Europe and Asia was mind boggling and it was getting worse by the moment. What were the motivations for the 1944 Bretton Woods conference and why did it matter? It mattered a great deal, and it goes to something that we touched on earlier in our conversation, Ed. Um, Bretton Woods was all about international finance, and it was recognized by all these policymakers. We talk about history. One of the subjects that I love to see when we look at leaders in World War II is how World War I influenced them, and they talked an awful lot about the failure of the Treaty of Versailles, and they thought, you know, all these things lead to the Great Depression. Uh, not trying to go through all the theories there, but they recognize the ties. And what was going on essentially at Bretton Woods was that you had the eclipse of the British Empire being taken place financially by the rising United States economic superpower. Um, the key provision, Britain could not basically hold up a dollar, uh, excuse me, a gold standard anymore. And after the war, they knew that they were going to have bad times. Um, the key provision of the agreement was the United States agreed to buy gold at $35 an ounce after the war. And essentially, we put ourselves on the gold standard. All the other nations of the world could then float their currencies against the dollar. What that essentially meant was that the pound uh, or the Reich or the mark, I should say, not the Reich mark, but uh, you know, uh, other currencies would float and you might have a pile of foreign currency, but if you could convert that into dollars, you knew that you could always convert it into gold at a stable rate is what that essentially meant. And this becomes the foundation of the post-war economic order for 25, 26 years. The United States eventually has to abandon this in 1971 because we couldn't afford to buy gold at that, at that price anymore. But it is the basis for the rebuilding of Europe. It provided that financial stability where they talk about the European Lazarus of the 1950s, where their economies came back stronger. Japan, I think, can be included in this in this as well and Bretton Woods was the financial basis that allowed this John Maynard Keynes was there he was negotiating yeah. on behalf of the British and he had a different vision of how the World Bank would perform but the United States Treasury uh, uh, Secretary Undersecretary a uh, guy named Harry Dexter White uh, it was his plan that actually went into place and what you saw, the, the IMF, uh, International Monetary Fund, became the most important element in international finance, not the World Bank, as Keynes wished. And with that, you had American leadership in the post-war international economy, right. the financial no, the, angle on it. <laughs> right. 
course, uh, Harry Dexter White will get in a little bit of trouble mm. later on during the Cold War, but that's another topic. Uh, I have one more question uh, before we get to what's already looking like a great list of questions on our on our feed, um, which is how had just to sum up how had the place of the United States within the global economy changed by 1945? Say, if you contrast 1939 to 1945, what had changed? What had really changed, I think, um, was the immensity of our industrial and military and economic prowess. Um, this is something that, you know, it's, 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 it's really about perspective in a way. I always point out that, look, you know, in the 19th century, the United States was the leading industrial power on the planet. We were an economic superpower then, but we were not a military power and we weren't very involved with the rest of the world. Uh, that really changes with World War II. By 1945, we had something like 67, I want to say two thirds of the world's gold supply. Wow. 60% of the world's shipping. We actually had something like 50%. I want to say it was right at 50% of the world's GDP. Half wow. of everything being produced in the world was coming out of the United States. Now, that's a moment that cannot last. It's the pinnacle in 1945, and we knew that. Mm -hmm. You know, if we didn't rebuild, uh, then you were going to face revolution and instability in the rest of the world. We knew that. But as a result of our dominance, the question was, how does the world rebuild? And we're the only ones that can do it economically. But mm -hmm. did we have the political willpower? We didn't after the First World War. We didn't want to have anything to do with the rest of the world. Here's where it changes, and we assume those responsibilities. Um, and it's not always fun, you know, being a, uh, uh, a world leader that way, taking responsibility for world affairs. But that's what we did in the post-war era. But it was based on American economic superiority. That's for sure. And I think we should do another webinar at some point about reconstruction because that's a, that's a huge issue in of itself. But let's get to uh, the questions. Uh, we have a number of them. I'll start maybe with ones that are a little bit simpler to, to answer. Uh, Lynn asked a little bit, a little while ago, did the 1.2% unemployment you were talking about earlier, did that count all Americans or just working age Americans? Working age Americans. They're not counting children or retirees. Right. Okay, just wanted to, wanted yeah. to uh, mm -hmm. give that clarification. Uh, let's see, I uh, have a question that you mentioned that uh, many in the military were worried that Len Lease would leave the U.S. Armed Forces bare for defense. Was the concern within the military that Len Lease would indeed provoke war? I don't think there was ever a... Um... Well, when you say provoke war, with whom, I guess, is, is where my mind leaps to. Uh, as I understand the, the question, would it provoke war with Britain? Because, no, absolutely not. You know, that was never going to happen with Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt at the helm. We were allies. And uh, uh, for better or worse, we, we knew that we had to support each other. Now, the question is, you know, would it provoke war with Nazi Germany? Yeah. Well, that kind of leads to what we were talking about earlier, that in 1941, we're loading up ships. They're going to be sent across the Atlantic, and it's full of military equipment, guns and tanks and planes that are going to be used to kill Germans. And it's not garden hoses. And we were in an undeclared shooting war uh, in the fall of 1941 with the Germans. U-boats were, you know, the Reuben James is the famous example, I think, uh, 115 uh, Americans were killed. There were a couple of other incidents on the high seas and people were holding their breath in late 1941 thinking war is coming and it's going to come with Nazi Germany is the thing. Um, instead, it came at Pearl Harbor where we weren't looking for it. But Roosevelt, Roosevelt, that's the, you know, some have said Roosevelt, uh, intentionally took this policy to get us closer to war. Um, there's something to that, I suppose, in that he wasn't going to let Britain go down, but he also was not willing to, uh, you know, ask Congress for a, a declaration of war against the Germans, even though they were sinking uh, 
some of our ships because he thought it was too much like what Wilson had done in the First World War, and he didn't. He, he wanted right. something absolute, <laughs> and right. Pearl Harbor was it. Yeah, that that kind of made the decision for him. Uh, I've got a couple of shout outs. Uh, one is to Joe tuning in all the way from Madrid, Spain. Welcome, Joe, and uh, welcome to any of our other international guests. We're glad to have you here, and I think, obviously, this is a topic that has uh, international importance. And also to our friend Kathy Metcalf, who's Walt Ehlers' daughter, is watching. Welcome, Kathy. It's great to have you here. I uh, had a question a little while ago from Tommy on uh, Facebook. Do you have a favorite two or three books on this topic that you could recommend? The Collected Works um, of John Maynard Keynes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can start with that one uh, for the theory, right? Um, yeah. I, I, a book that uh, came out about, uh, I don't know, seven or eight years ago that I enjoyed a great deal was Arthur Herman's book, Freedom's Forge. Uh, okay. I believe it was nominated for a Pulitzer, and it focuses largely on um, what's great about it is that it brings in it, uh, the, the stories of uh, William Knudsen and uh, uh, Henry Kaiser, the shipbuilding uh, magnet as uh, the focal points on how industry responded. Um, I, I, it's, it's, it's a good book. I, I don't agree with everything that Arthur writes, but he's a great historian. And, and so um, if you haven't read that one, that's, that's one I would definitely recommend. Um, a couple of the others uh, tend to be a little bit more academically inclined. Uh, Mark Harris, I think, was his name. Um, I don't have my uh, bookshelf in front of me. Wrote a wrote a great uh, book comparing uh, the economics, the economies of different uh, the, the major combatants in World War II. It's 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 more academic and, and a lot of statistics and things like that in it. Uh, that if, if you really want a deeper dive, you could kind of look into that one. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask us a couple more questions before we uh, uh, end up. And one of them is my question. I wanted to get back to a point I touched on earlier is uh, you had mentioned uh, the importance of American financial aid to the UK. Uh, that was profound. And uh, obviously the UK is in a totally different situation in 1945 than it had been before to the point of practically being financially dependent on the United States and then having to get into its own period of austerity. But even more so, how important was American aid to the Soviet Union? Did that, did that have a big impact on Soviet conduct of the war? Yes, it did. And it was a definite contribution. Um, the statistic that I think uh, sticks in my head is that we, I want to say, shipped something like 2.3 million uh, Jeeps or something like that in the Soviet Union. I, I'd want to double check that number, but Jeeps, trucks, boots was a big thing that we sent to the Soviet Union, food supplies, things like that. Um, they, uh, of course, had their industry shipped over the Ural Mountains, and they were producing military equipment there. I think that anything that we could contribute to keep the Soviets in the war was viewed uh, as a necessity and a positive uh, uh, contribution to the war effort because and this gets into the diplomacy with this, but you know, you can't forget um, that it was the Soviets who were really bearing the brunt of the war. And seven uh, out of every 10 German soldiers that were killed in World War II were killed by the Red Army. You know, uh, 8.6 million uh, Red Army soldiers were killed, 8.6 million, to put that into perspective, you know, uh, the United States lost over 400,000 total um, in World War II. That was just the Red Army. We're not even talking about, you know, Soviet civilians and that sort of thing, where, I mean, I've seen estimates as high as 27 million total in the nation. Most scholars agree somewhere in that 23 to 26, 27 million range. You know, you start thinking about um, the immensity of the damage that was going on over there. And that was, that was where the ball game was going to be won or lost, I, I think. Um, if, uh, 
if Hitler had succeeded in defeating the Soviet Union, um, then our task uh, would have been much exponentially uh, more difficult, and the world would look very, very different, obviously, if, if Nazi Germany had triumphed in the East. You know, uh, Western Europe probably would not look anything uh, like it eventually came to look. No doubt about it. I, I thought it was poignant. Uh, I won over to the former Soviet Union right after 1991. And I remember seeing, as other people uh, saw over there too, uh, Russian and other East European uh, farmers still have World War II era American trucks and Jeeps uh, mm -hmm. that they were still using uh, there, which I, I thought was a real testament to American aid to the Soviets. Uh, any final points, Keith, that that you would like to, to make about this topic? Well, I think the main thing is just when we look at a country and its position in the world, you know, they call economics the dismal science, and it is, you know, I'm uh, not really the best with the numbers and things like that, but it is essential to understanding um, that the economy ultimately is what enables the life of a nation and its people to prosper and do well. It is the basis of your military power as well. It is possible to be a military superpower and not have the best economic foundations. Look at the post-war Soviet Union, but we also see how that can't last in the long run. Right. So these are, these are things that are very, very important in the world. As I've always said, uh, my way of looking at the world, you know, uh, uh, nothing trumps war because people die and you can't come back from that. But second, everybody's got to make a living. So the economic foundations of how a nation, you know, uh, works and interacts with other countries in the world is something to pay a lot of close attention to because wars are built on those things. That's certainly something we're aware of these days at that point that everybody's got to make a living. Uh, thank you, Keith, so much for your contribution. Uh, this, this has been great, and I do think we ought to consider a follow-up to talk about uh, reconstruction at some point in the near future. I want to uh, conclude by inviting our guests to uh, join Thursday and Friday's 11 a.m. Central Time webinars. In particular, join the National World War II Museum and the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center for a special two-part webinar series designed for students and families. It's titled, From Barbed Wire to Battlefields about Japanese internment in World War II. Thanks to all of you. This has been great, and thank you especially, Keith. Fantastic. Thanks.